Well, that's the top of the hour. Hopefully you've got your coffee in hand and you're ready to learn about Zoom's tips and tricks. Now to start us off, I'm going to take down my slides because I think Zoom is so much more enjoyable when we can see each other, especially when we've got the meeting format like today. So I would love it if you would pretty please turn on your video and you are more than welcome to unmute yourself and jump in and discuss anything at any time. Because today, one of the things that we're talking about is how to manage a Zoom meeting. So instead of doing a webinar today, we've got you in the Zoom meeting format. And this is the format that anyone has access to when they have a free account or a pro account. So, uh, or any account really in Zoom. So you can run a meeting like this on the free account with up to three people. Or after three people, you get a 40 minute time frame. If you're on a pro account, you can have a meeting for 24 hours if you like right now. I'm going to be very upfront and open and honest about how I'm managing the meeting today as well. So I would love it if you would jump in with a question as soon as you have it. We don't have a dedicated Q&A at the end. Um, so yeah, please, as soon as you have a question, ask them. And you can probably hear there's right now, there's someone with a microphone where, who's got a bit of noise in the background. So one of the things that I'm doing right now is I have my manage participants window open. So down the bottom, you can see the Zoom controls and I am muting people where I can see that their microphone is, um, is showing through some noise. So if you ever have um, a meeting like this where you've got, you know, we're probably gonna have 20, 30 people, something like that. My number one top tip for you is to find a friend who can be your co-host. And this is a job that's fantastic for your co-host to do because at the beginning of the meeting, you ideally want to have a bit of energy and a bit of enthusiasm and brightness. And um, right now I'm admitting people through the waiting room. So all of you were stuck in the waiting room to begin with. I'm admitting people, listening out for microphone problems and muting them as they go. And I think that takes a really strong multitasking skill. And um, for me to be able to look attentive and not look like I'm completely distracted by the process that's going on. Now give me a thumbs up if you think that I still look attentive even though I'm doing that. Oh good, I've got a few, excellent. <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I've encouraged you to turn your videos on is because as a presenter on a meeting, it's quite difficult to get the best out of yourself if you're just looking at blank screens. And so that's why straight up at the beginning, I encouraged everyone to turn on their video. And it also gives you some feedback because this is what people look like on Zoom. You know, they look very miserable. And if you're looking at your face right now on screen, you've probably just corrected yourself a little bit because you probably look a little bit bored as well. And so, um, yeah, I think by seeing people's videos, you can really taper and change your energy as time goes on. Today, what we're going to cover is four separate things. I'm going to talk about looking your best on Zoom, sounding your best, how to manage meetings in a micro kind of sense, and also some things that you can do to raise the energy of Zoom. We've been like, you know, using Zoom about six weeks solid now. Um, I'm sure this isn't your first Zoom meeting. Give me a wave if it is your first Zoom meeting though. Okay, no waves. Yeah, there's no waves through the video. So everybody is, um, is a Zoom master now at attending. And you've probably sat through some really dull and flat webinars and some dull and flat meetings. And so I'm going to just talk specifically about that towards the end and what you can do to try and mix things up a bit and improve the energy, not only for yourself, but also for how your audience receives their message. Down the bottom is a chat button. I would love you to use it liberally. You can chat to me, you can chat to everyone. Uh, it, anything's fine. You can put a question in there for me if you're a little shy about unmuting your microphone or if maybe you've got some background noise behind you and you're uncomfortable about muting your microphone. So please use the chat liberally and I'll be monitoring it constantly throughout. Again, a fantastic multitasking uh, lesson is to be able to read chat and also look at your audience and talk about what's going on for the day. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail. Um, now, Holly, I've already got a first question. Holly Ann is asking, will I be talking about how to go live on Facebook as well? I probably won't cover that in any detail. We probably don't have enough time to do that other than just mentioning that it's there. I will say, Holly, it is quite easy though. 
So um, maybe you and I can do a one-on-one -on -one to talk about that in a lot more detail at another time. Do, is there anything that somebody come here today to learn a lot about? A burning question that you've got on your mind or um, something about Zoom that you really wanted to know? Give me a um, pop down in the chat and let me know. Somebody said that they'd love to know how you can monitor chat and video call uh, while on your phone. That's a really, really good question. I will say, Kristen, Kristen it's practically impossible. Unfortunately, the phone app is really restrictive. And when you use the phone app, you have to um, manually click the chat. And this is what it always looks like, is you will find your finger goes over the top of the camera all the time when trying to do the chat. The only thing you can really do is leave the chat window up and ignore everyone else. So my hot tip for you is if you're hosting a meeting, then using your phone is probably not going to be the best tool to conduct that successful meeting. All right, I've got some other questions in there as well, so I'm going to cover them a little bit later. Thank you all for being so involved already. Now, this is a, I'm going to share my screen right now and go through you know, the first couple of bits. So these are the things we're going to cover today, looking your best, sounding your best, managing your meetings and raising the energy. Now, you notice when I've shared my screen, the screen really dramatically takes over. And if my PowerPoint slides were totally awful, which, you know, these are some of the better ones that I've seen, uh, you would be getting death by PowerPoint exclusively because my video is this tiny little video probably in your top right. Is that true? Give me a nod if my video is really tiny on your screen. And, you know, we, Catherine's giving me a, a no. Can you not see my video at all, Catherine? Uh, I can see it on the full screen. Oh, okay. So that's a setting that you've got that you've taken over. So that's fantastic. Um, so Zoom can be personalized to your own settings and it remembers your settings when you come back. That's actually really good that you've done that. I do that as well when I'm attending. I make the slides really small and I make sure that I can see the presenter really big because it's so much more interesting. So one of my big tips for you is to minimize your use of slides as much as possible because it's just so much better. Look at your best. Let's start here. Now, did you see that picture of that girl sitting on her bed? I have got to tell you that I have been to many Zoom meetings where that's what the professional look of someone is, is they've got a really kind of inappropriate spot that they are using for their Zoom. And sometimes that causes things to happen. One of the things, for example, is I've been on a Zoom. Now, Paulette, I'm going to pick on you for a moment. I hope you don't mind. But Paulette is in exactly the same spot that I have seen two nude people on Zoom as someone was set up in their kitchen and the person has walked behind them. And you know what happens when there's a nude person on Zoom? Everybody starts looking at you. So, Paulette, hopefully you've got nobody nude in your household right now. But if you see in Normal's case, there's a person behind him and we don't have a great awareness of what's going on behind us. So my first tip for you is to have a think about where in your environment are you and ideally you try and put a wall behind you. And the reason for the wall behind you is just to minimize that movement that goes on just in case, you know, one of your kids runs in or, um, Somebody's teenage son decides to go to the fridge in the nude, which is what I got to see. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it also helps you with how you're displayed on screen. Because as a general rule, most people don't think about what is the light around them. So this is one of my top tips for looking your best. And the reason I've asked you to pop your video on today is so I can pick on you a little bit. I'm going to be very gentle with you, I promise. Catherine, can I pick on you for a moment? Is that all right? So I can see that Catherine has a light on one side of her, but not on the other side. So she's a little bit dark on one side, not quite like Phantom of the Opera, but a little bit. And so bringing some brightness to your face is very important when you're presenting because we don't have all of the same body language and exuberance. All you've got is your facial gestures yeah. and a little bit of hands just from here up. So try to light up the space. 
And I can see that Catherine can turn on and off some light in front of her. Maybe that's her monitor um, with looking at different things on screen. In my case, what I've done is I have a window directly in front of me. And so I've shifted my desk so that I, I'm looking straight at that window. Windows behind you tend to make you look a bit dark. So if you look at Kristen's video for a moment, sorry, Kristen, we're all looking at you. You'll see that her face is quite dark and she's washed and we can hardly see her facial expressions at all. But outside looks really amazing. So yeah, kudos to you. You've got a plant going on. The house is clean. Everything behind you looks fantastic. So what you could do is get a lamp or a light in front of you. So if you've got a nice lamp somewhere in the house, put it on your face. In my case, what I've done is I've bought a really cheap little circle ring light and I have that on as well. I'm going to show you what it looks like. So that's with it off. So it actually does make a difference. The window itself isn't enough for just the brightness and I can vary the intensity of that light. With a good webcam, it will also automatically adjust. So did you see when I first turned on the light, it was really intense. My webcam has also done some light adjustment to that and I can change it to different colors so I can look a little more romantic. Now, I use this one in the late evening when I want everyone to go to bed or the white light, which is better for during the day. I got it from Amazon, Catherine. And what I'll do towards the end of the session is I'll pop a link down in the chat so you can see. I think it was $35 or $40. It was very, very cheap. And it just clips onto my monitor and it has this roving arm that I can move around. So if I move a little bit, I can switch where the light is. It plugs into my USB port and just has a little remote so I can um, change up all of those settings, the color, turning it on or off or um, varying the intensity of the light. So honestly, I think it makes a big difference because the only facial expression you get is everything. From a presenter, they say that about 70% of your message is absorbed through body language. And so we only, who's been practicing their eyebrow? That, that's all we've got as presenters because the hands, you are often using them out of the screen. So yeah, that, that's your bit of body language. I would also encourage you to try very simple decor behind you because whatever is behind you can be really distracting. So you can see on my desk, this is, uh, you can see quite a bit of my desk. This is the edge of my computer. I have cleared off all of this space. So you can't see my notebook and my usual pile of um, business magazines and my pencil case and all of the, the things that usually sit there. And so I've specifically cleared that for the meeting for that minimal decor, that cleanliness look in the background. So have a look at your video and have a look behind you in your video and just see, is there something that maybe could be cleared up? Could you shift things a little bit? Is there, um, is there something you could remove or something you can put in place? You will see that a couple of our co people connected today, so Agatha, Catherine and Trevor, I can tell that you are pro Zoom users because you all have virtual backgrounds. And so Trevor isn't really sitting outside in the yard on a lovely autumn day. He's got a photo that he's put behind him. Now, Agatha, if I can pester Agatha, because she actually works for Business Station, and so she's one of the controllers of this ASPAS program. Can I get you to just to give everyone a bit of a wave so people can look at your video? Can you see how Agatha's arm disappears? This is one of the biggest dangers with, okay, thank you, Agatha. Right, this is one of the biggest dangers with virtual background is what happens is Zoom will try to figure out who you are and it will put the background behind you while removing what is behind you. Now, hopefully, Agatha, you're in a, a, a place where you can turn that background off. Well, would you mind turning it off just so we can see what is really behind Absolutely. you as well? Thank you. Absolutely. And I will say that the backgrounds are fantastic for hiding what's behind you, but I would only ever use them in an emergency. So you've got a nice clean wall behind you, and even still, it's not chopping you out properly. So it is still taking your hand out. So thank you. You can turn it back on if you want to. Um, in Catherine's case, she's got a really beautiful image. So you can see when she moves, she doesn't have a white halo around her, like we saw in Agatha's picture. Or if we have a look at Trevor's, if you look underneath his headphones, you can see just a little bit of his real life poking through underneath there. A green screen really helps outline you. Um, Catherine, are you brave enough to turn it off so we can show everyone what a green screen is? Yeah, thank you. 
So what a green screen does is it's a specific color that video cameras and, um, and, and just everyday normal cal cameras are calibrated to pick up so that you can more easily remove people. It's um, something that's been around for a really long time. So there we go. Catherine, the green actually looks really good. Is this one that clips to your chair? It's not, it's a full proper green screen. Yeah. So um, do you mind unmuting yourself for just a second, yes. Catherine? And telling us, how much did you pay for it? Do you remember? $132 at a photography shop in Perth. Yep. And it was the last one in Perth a few weeks ago. So I didn't have a choice oh. of price. I needed one there and then. So yep. It yeah. certainly made a great difference to you, so to your virtual backgrounds, because mostly you do lose bits of your shoulder and your ears and things as you move. So in your yes. case, yours is really crisp. Thank you so much for offering to turn it off. You're now, welcome. I've got a question from Chris in the chat. Um, how do you set a virtual background? If you look in the bottom left, you'll see the stop video button. Now, Zoom has recently done an update. So some people will have a little up arrow next to that button, and some have the up arrow on top of that button. But in any case, you need to click the up arrow, and you'll have an option that says choose virtual background. And so from there, you can just find any old random photo on, on your computer. My recommendation is that you try, if you want to use this, you, you try to find something that's a little more natural. Because Kristen, that's exactly what happens to me all the time. So do you, can you turn that back on again? I just want to show everybody is that it, it misidentifies who the person is. And so the virtual background isn't working very well. In my case, it always takes out my teeth, just like it did for you as well. So I'm not a really big fan, even with the green screen. So yeah, you should choose something that's not a bright, intense photo. Trevor's is actually pretty good in that how he is lit on his face and the background behind him is similarly lit. Because what people tend to do is choose a background that has a lot of white or a lot of brightness in it, and it makes you look even darker. So if you do want to go down the virtual background end, try something that has natural lighting rather than maybe a digitally produced image or something that's been really heavily enhanced. So Catherine, you might be able to find something that's a little bit more natural, maybe a, a boardroom setting, and that would make your face not look quite as dark as it is, it, you know, just because that one behind you is a little bit bright. So have you found where the virtual background is, is Chris? Would, would you like to give it a crack? And I also have a message here from Nermal, which is, he's quite right, is older computers can't run virtual backgrounds. Is it does have some system requirements. Strangely enough, my phone can handle it just fine, but I have an old laptop as well, and it doesn't handle it very well. Oh, look, Holly Ann's got hers working. Very good. That's really cute. You work in childcare, Holly? Oh yeah, fantastic. It suits your background then. So if you do have a virtual background and you find that if you move, it takes away part of your body, like in your case, it just took away a bit of your hair. You just have to learn to sit a little bit more still. That's it, that tips better. The lighting looks, yeah, that looks great. Can I ask a question? Please. So if I had a green screen behind me, would that stop some of that? It would reduce it heavily. It, it doesn't eliminate it completely. I think the quality of the green screen makes a difference. Now, in Catherine's case, she got it from a, oh, um, I've got one. a camera shop. Oh, you've got one. Oh, well, you should try it and see. Yeah. yeah, it will definitely reduce it. But in some cases, I've seen people with green screens that they tend to have a white halo around them still, but it minimizes their body parts being chopped off. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Now, we have a question in the chat from Gina to explain what the mirror option is. And um, that's a really good question. So... If you just tick it, it's the tick box that says mirror my video. See how I jumped on the other side? Now, the, the reason why you would put mirror your video is because if you don't and you raise your hand, it looks like your other hand's being raised and it kind of tricks you a little bit. And um, for ladies, if you've ever tried to put lipstick on in one of those reverse mirrors, it's really, really hard. So it's really for your enjoyment so that you you know that when you raise this hand, that's the one that's coming on and doesn't come up that side of the screen. So I would turn it on just for yourself. Um, Ginger, feel free to give it a try if you've got a camera there and you can connect it. Now, I, I would also recommend, you'll see that um, I'm back at the office now, but even when I was presenting from home, I still put a full face of makeup on. And this harks back to 
the days of the theatre. If anybody has ever been involved in a theatre production, you will know that you get a very heavy face of makeup. They put on the stuff first called pancake to even out your skin tone. And then uh, all of the makeup for theatre is very dramatic. And the reason is because the video transmission just takes a lot of you away. It's more difficult to see your features. Uh, you look washed out. Some people say it adds pounds, all sorts of things but the makeup just helps your features be a little more distinguished. To the fellas, you could try it too if you like. A little bit of mascara never hurt anybody. Uh, Trevor's not so keen, <laughs> but um, it, it does help for the ladies. It, it is a really big help. I Sometimes when I'm on meetings at night, I notice just how different my video looks. I give everyone a really hot tip though. If you press on the up arrow next to your stop video, and you click video settings, there is a tick box there that says touch up my appearance. I would strongly recommend you turn that on. You won't be able to see the results, but everybody else will be able to. And it just gives you a bit more brightness, your skin's a little smoother, takes away all of your wrinkles, it's so good. So it actually doesn't take away any wrinkles, but it does make a difference to your visual appearance. So I just leave that turned on and Zoom then always remembers that that setting is turned on, so I don't have to think about it again. Uh, Chris has also had a recommend, uh, asked about a recommendation with re regards to a webcam. So in my case, I use an external webcam, not the webcam that's built in to my um, laptop. And I'll show you the reason. And this is actually really, really cool. Is I'm going to swap cameras. So hold tight. Hi. This is my laptop camera. See how it's gritty and grainy and looks a bit dirty? It's not very good quality. It's okay, but it wouldn't be the video that I would want to use all of the time for presenting. So I have three screens. So I'm gonna swap back to the other one now. Here we go. See how much brighter it is, how much nicer it is? So if you can get an external webcam, it does make a really big dramatic difference. Now I'll include a link to it in the kit as well in a bit, but the one that I have is a Logitech one. Uh, it's a 1080p HD, but webcams are very, very hard to get hold of right now. So I haven't seen one in Officeworks for at least six weeks. Um, we've, had, we've wanted some more for our team and we haven't been able to source any. And chances are in your neck of the woods, it might be difficult as well. You possibly could get one delivered from an online retailer. But um, yeah, I, it's been, yeah, Holly's shaking her head. She hasn't been able to get one either. It is really, really challenging. Uh, this particular one is fantastic because it has a screw top that I can put onto a tripod. And so I have a little mini tripod to be able to move it around as well if my settings aren't quite ideal. And I will say, here's some tips for using your camera. You wanna get it as close to eye level as you can. So in my case, if you have a look where my eye level is, my camera is just a little bit above that. And that I think is a bit too high. I've got a new monitor and it's a bit taller than my old one. And so I'll, I'm going to need to use my tripod to bring it down a little bit because maintaining, maintaining that eye contact with your audience makes a big difference to their energy and their attentiveness. So if you can shift yours around, just about everyone has their spot on today. Um, Rowena and John, you're probably the only two people that really could use a little bit of improvement with your webcam. And you may also need to adjust your screen as well if the angle's a little bit wrong. So John, you've got the classic looking up your nose angle. We can't actually see right up your nose, but what I would do is raise your computer up on a couple of books and try to get the actual computer height a little bit closer to your eyes. Incidentally, if you're using your, your computer for longer times, this is better for eye strain anyway. You ideally should be looking in the center of your monitor and looking down rather than up. Um, and Rowena, you, you might be able to bring yours up a little bit higher as well, perhaps some books for you too. But just about everyone else, the angle is quite good. All right, let me just jump back into our share. Um, do, does anyone have any more questions around looking your best on screen? No more, I know you said that the touch up doesn't seem to work for you. <laughs> um, you look much better on our end though, it's just you who can't see it. Yeah, yeah, your beard looks very glossy today. <laughs> It's just probably added a bit of shine. All right, no more questions. So I'm just going to summarize what we just went through. So, how to look your best. Move your camera around so it's at your eye level. 
try to buy a webcam when we can finally get them again. Face your windows rather than look having them behind you and add a face light, a lamp or one of these circle, um, circle ideas, any, anything like that will help bring your features out. Behind you, you want to reduce any clutter that you have. My preference is for not to use a virtual background unless you are not going to move much or you have a great green screen. So I would say Catherine's looks really good. That's definitely acceptable, but you will need to work on the virtual background if you're going to use them. Face a wall behind you or be really careful of traffic moving in and out, just in case the odd naked person comes, back, comes behind and add some makeup. It makes a big difference. Next, we're going to move on to the section around sounding your best. So that is, how can we improve the sound? Most of us just use the sound equipment that we have built into our, our computers, and that's not amazing for being able to hear you. I can see Trevor has a really fantastic headphone set there. Trevor, do you mind unmuting yourself and just saying a quick hello so we can hear the quality of your sound? Yeah, sure, happy to. I found the headphones, it's great. I'm working in an office, it's pretty busy. There's people all the way around me. So I can hear my voice and I wonder what I'm talking about, but they're not hearing the rest of the meeting and everybody else. So I find that's what's been a bit short. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Now in my case, I have a set of headphones that's called bone conducting. And I like them because they give me a lot of freedom. They're a Bluetooth headphone, they cost about 250. They're fairly expensive. But they're really fantastic because they can pick up my sound, I can move around a bit, and I'm not tethered to my computer. My backup though, in case something happens to these, is these guys. It's a set of wired headphones, these are from Jabra, and these are what we use around the office as the normal headphones for answering the phone. So um, I think they're fantastic for if you're in an office environment. This style is better because these don't go into my ear, they go over and they actually vibrate against my jaw. So they're the same kind of tech that's in a bionic ear. But um, these ones are best if you need to reduce the amount of surround sound, especially from a presentation perspective. Now I'm lucky today, we don't have everybody in the office yet. And so I can minimize the amount of movement and noise around me. But if I couldn't, if we had the full office here, I'd be onto these because I get really distracted by the noise that, that moves around the office when I'm trying to present. Now, but there's already so many other things to multitask with, and that's an extra one. Trevor, please, unmute yourself and jump on in. Oh, you haven't unmuted yourself yet. Bottom left button. We've still, we've still got you muted. There we go. Uh, yeah, I was just waving goodbye to Catherine. She's got to go to work. Oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. One thing I will say is as soon as you start a meeting, you should test your sound. How you do that is on the microphone button there, if you click the little up arrow on it, you'll see test speakers and microphone. That's the first thing I do whenever I start a meeting because chances are I might have changed between my two headphones and I need to make sure the right ones are connected, that my levels are fine, that the microphone pickup still works. And um, if things are going to go wrong and really raise your blood pressure, it's going to be the sound not working. So I would always recommend you do that. As a general rule, you should encourage your attendees to stay muted and you also should stay muted when you're not talking. And the reason for this is just to minimize all of the background distraction that happens with Zoom. And honestly, if I was to unmute you all right now, someone will have some background noise and it will be crazy distracting for everyone else. Uh, there's the odd dog bark or kids coming in. It, it's, it's really quite distracting, the background noise. If you know that you're in an environment which is troublesome and you need to talk on a meeting, so Trevor, I'm looking at you right now with background noise from the office, you could try a technology called CRISP. It's a fairly new tech. You install it on your computer and it specifically looks out for background noise and it applies a filter when it hears it. So if you know you've got a noisy dog and it's that dog or clock kind of day where people start to walk past outside and the dog starts to bark, it's a fantastic technology for unexpected sounds. I'm just going to pop the link to it right down in the chat. It installs as a sound driver on your computer and it's absolutely sensational for um, difficult noise environments where you still want to be participating. So I would try that. 
Does anyone have a question around their sound or would they like to unmute themselves and get some feedback around um, your microphone and, and, and your sound at all? Or are you all shy? No, Trevor, please. Yeah, everybody aware of using the space bar to unmute yourself? Oh, that's a fantastic tip. Do you want to tell everyone about it? Go on. All right, um, I, I'm on mute, but if you push down the space bar, that temporarily unmutes you. And only while you're speaking, as soon as you're finished speaking, you take your fingers off the space bar. It's really good. Uh, I will say that it can trick you. So you need to have the Zoom window active for it to work. Otherwise, it won't work. And I have actually been on a panel discussion where I accidentally hit my space bar while I was speaking and it muted me. So it is something to be careful of as well. But um, it's really useful for where you're in a situation like this and people want to be able to jump in. So um, yeah, it, it's really useful for things like that. Now, hold tight, I'm just gonna share my screen and I'm going to walk us through to the next section. So, sound your best. These are what we just covered. Try a headset because you'll find it minimizes distractions and dramatically improves your voice and volume to your participants. Be careful of any movement. This is especially important if you're using a tethered headset with a cable or if you're maybe using the headset from your phone. If you've got jewelry on, it will whack against the microphone and produce this funny little buzzing sound every time you move. Test your sound every single time and stay muted as much as possible. And then test out that crisp that I mentioned, especially if you're in an environment that needs uh, you know, some minimization to what's going on around you. Right, next we're gonna talk about managing our meetings. And what I mean by that is how do you manage uh, the, the functionality parts of it? So first of all, if you want to share your screen on Zoom, uh, oh, actually, you know what? We're going to look at the controls first. So have a look down the bottom and you'll notice that you have controls. Now by default, Zoom hides these when you're in a meeting and you may need to move your mouse around to see them. As a participant, you get a different set of controls to what I get as the host, but they're not a great deal different. So first you will see participants. And if you click on that, you can see who's connected. Uh, this participant is really, really useful for you as a host because I can see who is muted, who has their video off, and, um, and the whole big list of everybody there. So if I need to quickly find someone to unmute them, then I can search at the top, which is really useful for managing very large meetings. So a fortnight ago, I helped an organization with their annual AGM. There was 430 people connected and they required that everyone has their video on because they were voting delegates. And so they needed to confirm there was actually somebody at the other end. And so managing that many people is quite difficult when you want to be able to unmute someone to speak to a motion or something like that. And so the search is really important when you have a larger scale meeting and you need to manage them that way. Um, I usually keep the manage participants window open constantly so that I can jump in and mute people as soon as they have some background noise. So in many meetings, you'll find that they're mic off meetings and you won't have so much management to do. But if we were to open everyone's mic and we have a discussion, I'll need to mute them very quickly when there's problems. And sometimes someone will talk and they'll leave their microphone on accidentally. And so then, you know, they'll get some background noise at some point. Now, if you have a look at that list, let me tell you how it works because it has some order to it. Right up the top is the host and any co-hosts. They will always be at the very top. And so today we've got Agatha as the co-host and then me as the host. So we've gone right to the top. Underneath that will be anybody with an active microphone. And so that means if you need to mute someone quickly, they will always come below your host and co-host for if you need to find them fast. And that honestly is so useful. And you might be able to see, can you see my microphone moving up and down? as I talk, yeah, so that shows that that microphone is active. It just goes empty when there's no sound. So, well, I'm making too much noise. So it just goes empty if nobody's talking. 
So that's how you can find and mute people quickly. I honestly think this is one of the most useful things is to use that managed participants window. Now, generally, if I am on, um, on a computer at all, I have more than one monitor. So if you've only got one monitor, give me a wave. Yeah, so a few, most people on the call only have one monitor. I can tell you that it dramatically improves your productivity to have a second monitor. So see if you can convince someone to, to buy you another monitor or to or put it in the company budget because it does help a lot. And when you're presenting on Zoom, it helps a huge amount. And the reason is I have on one monitor Zoom and I have on my other monitor the participants window and then I also have the chat window. And I move that over and away depending on what the priority is at the time. So at the beginning when I had to admit you all in, I had my participants window front and center because whoever is in the waiting room goes to the top. And that's how I can look like I'm maintaining eye contact with you while still actually doing active meeting management. And if, if I was to unmute you all, that's what I would do as well, is I would shift the participants window to the middle so I could mute you all if there was a problem. So that's how I, I take advantage of the multiple monitors. If we're going to be doing a lot of chat, like if I ask you all a question, can you put in the chat where you're located, please? Then I would move the chat window front and center as well, as close to the camera as I can, just to maintain that, that eye contact. But honestly, I need that chat window open so I can see the movement for when, when you're asking things. If you have it closed, it does have a pop-up on Zoom above the controls, but I don't think it's as, as easy to see as it is when it's open. Now, you also have a big green share screen in the middle. Is that right? You can all see the big green share screen. I'm going to just swap to my PowerPoint for a second and I'm going to show you a slide. So first of all, this is me. I did a screenshot before we started. And the reason I wanted to show you this is what the host controls look like. So they don't look a great deal different to what you can see. I can see that there's a security tab that you don't have. Participants in the old version of Zoom is called manage participants for the host. In the new version, they've taken out the manage. And so they look a little bit different. All right, next slide in. When you go to share something, this is what you see. You get a pop-up over the top and it shows you everything that you have open. You'll see something compared, if you click the share screen, it'll look a bit different for you. Something that I do is I close just about everything that I've got open. And the reason for this is I want to really minimize any kind of background noise that I've got going on with my computer. So you'll see there's no email open there. We use a soft phone at work and my phone is definitely turned off because if it rings, otherwise you all can hear it. And I haven't got anything there open that I'm not going to use. I think this is really important so that you can do the share fairly smoothly because there is a stop and an awkwardness when you do the share. Something else you'll see is at the top, screen one and screen two, they're my monitors. So if I shared with you screen two, everything that happens on that screen you can see. It's useful if you're demonstrating some software or if you have to swap between different programs. But other than that, I would never ever share my screens. And the reason is because most people have stuff open that they've forgotten about. And I can't tell you the number of people's emails that I've seen because they've shared their screen and you know, email is sensitive corporate data. I definitely wouldn't want to be sharing that with people. So first thing, big tip is to minimize everything, close everything you don't need. And number two, if you don't need to share your screen, then don't. Only ever share the bits down below, which is the individual programs that I want to share. And you see there, there's two versions of PowerPoint. The first one is the slideshow and it's taken up the full screen. And the second one is the meat and potato side of PowerPoint. That's where you do your editing. I would always only ever share the screen, the, the slideshow part, because that straight away takes up full screen. And this is the thing that you find most presenters get wrong, is they'll share the meat and potato side, and then they'll click share slide or start the slideshow. 
And sometimes things go wrong. So some of the things that go wrong is maybe it opens in presenter view, so they don't see it how they should see it. And another thing that could go wrong is uh, maybe PowerPoint crashes on them where they try to open the slideshow. I've seen that a couple of times too. So before this meeting started, what I did is I opened up my PowerPoint, I started my slideshow, and then when I'm sharing with you, I'm going to do the one on the bottom left the one that says PowerPoint slideshow, not the name of my actual PowerPoint. Now, is that clear for everybody? Give me a nod, because I can only see a few of your faces. Yep, cool. I honestly think that this is one of the trickiest things to get right. And it's something that most meetings do a lot of, is sharing. So my recommendation to you is you do this with some friends. You call up a friend and say, hey, I just need to test something on Zoom. Or you ask one of your colleagues, um, can I please try this? And so here's your instructions again. Open up your PowerPoint, start the slideshow, press share screen, and just share the slideshow. Also, you'll notice that I swap off the slideshow all the time. It's because it's just so much more interesting to talk to people than it is to see those slides solidly the whole time. Now my last little tip for you for uh, managing your meetings is to have a run sheet. And Agatha um, offered to be my co-host today and I said, Agatha, you know what, I don't need a co-host today. Um, we've done this so many times, we're all good, but I'm going to call in co-host duties because Agatha has this fantastic run sheet that's been created by another um, consultant and they've given us permission to share it. So um, if I can lean on you, Agatha, to find that run sheet and to pop a link to it in the chat so everyone can download it, you're able to copy it and make it your own. But the great thing about a run sheet is it means that, oh, that's fantastic. You've already got a short URL for it and everything. Is it means you don't forget stuff because ideally you'll have some housekeeping. Lots of people when they present on Zoom, one of the major reasons why they're doing it is they want to be able to save the recording and share it. So they might be sharing it to um, their, their email newsletter or to their tribe or they're going to turn into a part of an online course. And here's what happens about 20 minutes in. Oh no, I forgot to start the recording. <laughs> and then they have to re-record it again. You've maybe even heard this on Zoom. So two tips for that is when you create the meeting, you can actually automatically ask it to record and then you never forget it. But what that means is at the beginning when you're doing your setup and you know, you're checking yourself in the video, I've got any lunch in my teeth, and uh, you're doing your share and so forth, um, that's recorded as well. And so if you have the auto recording, you will have to trim off the beginning of that recording because it will be um, a little too functional for most people, but it will mean you won't forget it. The other way you can do it is if you're not so okay with, with video editing, you just have it in your run sheet that you've got a housekeeping item to say, everybody, we're going to be recording today, and then you hit the record button. And so that's another way you can manage it. Incidentally, in Zoom settings, there is lots of different settings related to recording. You can record screen only, the presenter only, everybody. There's so many different options. One of the things I will say is if you're going to be using your recording for something else, so maybe you're going to share it with your tribe or you're going to include it in a course, the cloud recordings are lower quality than the computer recording. So you get two options, record on your computer or record on the cloud. And so if you're reusing it for something important, then download it to your computer because you'll get a much more high quality video. If you're just going to be using it because uh, maybe you need to take the minutes from a meeting, then just do the cloud recording and don't worry about it. But yeah, if, if the recording quality is important to you, then I would definitely use, um, use the record to your computer option. Now, back again, I'm going to jump back into my slideshow and it's really confusing because this screen is the share screen and when I click share screen it looks exactly like this so it can really trick you up. Here's all of the overview of the manager meeting. So know your controls and have a play with them so people so you can invite people to use them. Try that pro version of sharing your screen and that is to open the slideshow first and share the slideshow only. Turn on your co-host capabilities inside Zoom so that you can have a co-host. It needs to be turned on in Zoom first 
you can't just randomly make someone a co-host mid-meeting. So um, you must have that turned on first, but it is so good to have a co-host. Uh, there's, there's lots and lots of um, things that you will be able to think of that a co-host will just jump in there and do for you. Turn off everything on your computer as much as possible so that you can minimize any distractions or pop-ups or anything like that. Practice with friends and co-workers. It makes a really big difference to your overall presentation. Mute people. You do that on the participant screen. Mute them liberally. Sometimes at the beginning of a workshop or a presentation, I might say, don't be offended today if I mute you. It will just be some background noise coming through uh, your microphone. So if you see that you've been muted, just have a look around and see if there's something going on. Watch the chat for messages. And I can see that Holly's asked me a question that I'll cover in just a second. And then finally, have a run sheet. It makes a really big difference. You know, we have run sheets in normal events. So have a run sheet for your online event as well. So Holly, your question is, how do you position yourself if there's two people on the call? Can you put yourself on the left? So do you mean uh, the videos, how they sort of move around? No, there's no easy way, unfortunately, but I will show you a cool little trick. Is that with, um, if you have a look in the top right of Zoom, you'll see that there's a button that says speaker view or gallery view. And you can change that as a participant to see speaker view, you'll have me really big on screen, or gallery view, which I prefer to call Brady Bunch mode. So when I'm presenting to you, I put it on Brady Bunch mode so I can see you all. But speaker view is really useful for if somebody wants to be front and center. So if you're swapping between a lot of presenters, shifting the speaker view is really useful. So let me show you that. Um, if I put uh, my cursor on the three little dots next to my video, I have an option to spotlight video. And so what that will do for everybody is that will make me really big, even if you're in that Brady Bunch mode. So it sort of takes over the user controls for Zoom. So it doesn't allow you to put people on the left or the right or anything like that. You don't have that kind of control, but you do have this kind of control to be able to make people really big. So now I'm gonna cancel the spotlight view, but it will keep everyone big. So if you want to change it up the top, you can change the gallery view to see everybody again. You can also, as a user, pin somebody else's video. So if you put your mouse over somebody, you'll be able to see that you've got the option to pin them. So that means that they will remain large, even if spotlight video is turned on. That can be really useful if you're on a presentation where everybody is going to be timed. So sometimes there'll be a timer who holds up cards or something like that, that I would pin the timer video so that I can see them permanently. It means you lose your audience a bit, but it means you keep the time. So some presentations I do, they actually um, discount how much they pay you if you go over time. So it's a really good way of keeping you on time is to do something like that. So does that sort of answer your question, Holly? The short answer is no, but there are some other options instead. Do you want to unmute yourself and talk about it further? Please. Unmute yourself is bottom left. Oh, yep. space bar. Um, I um, have been interviewing um, authors about the books that I sell. And yeah. so the first time I did it, um, I could be on the left and the girl was on the right. But every other one that I've done, exactly this, I haven't changed anything, but I'm always on the right. And it just doesn't, I don't like it as much. Yeah, I got you. The video ordering, I believe, is based on the order in which people enter. And it will be different to you for you than it is for everyone else. So I don't know if you want to tell me who's in your top left. Who's the first video? You. Cool. So for me, it's Vicky. So the order will be different for you than all your attendees anyway. Agatha, who's your top left? Cool. Oh, it's me as well. Awesome. Vicky, yeah. you're the lucky person. I can see you first. And so after my video, I come second on my screen and then I've got Sue. So you'll find that the order is all messed up for everyone. I think probably what you could do is maybe swap to speaker view and you'll see the strip of people at the top. Is there any reason why you wanted you on the left necessarily? Oh, it just is aesthetically because sort of, yeah, I'm interviewing them sort of thing and it just, 
um, yeah, it just worked better. Um, but I would have, because I sent out the link, so I would have thought she was in the, she would have been in the waiting room. I, I mean, it's been exactly the same for all of them, so I just don't understand. Yeah, got you. I do get um, video swapping as well if somebody connects and disconnects. And it will also be different based on how many people you have on screen. So you can change the number of people you can view at any time. All right, that will no, also just, call video swapping. So it's, it's just because it's a user base. Two. Say again? It's only ever going to be me and, and somebody that I'm interviewing. So there'll only ever be two in there. There'll only ever be two. Yeah. Okay. Um, look, I think the best thing you could do is use the spotlight option. That will be better for your attendees anyway, rather than the Brady Bunch mode. Yeah. I think you should use that instead. I should research that a little harder to, to learn the proper ordering, but um, I do know that speakers tend to be first. So if people have been muted the whole time, they don't tend to come up first. But like in my case, Agatha is now position number eight and she's shifted to position number two before when she was more active. So um, yeah, it, it is a little random, I think. And where was the spotlight thing up at the top? So it's a host only control. But when you put your mouse over the top of a video, you get three little dots. And then if you click that, that's a, like a right click menu. Okay. It's an option under there for host only. Yeah. So when you're the host next time, give it a crack. Yeah, we'll do. Thanks. No problem. All right. On to our next section. Let's talk through how do you raise the energy? What can you do to change the energy in a meeting? So. This guy looks pretty happy. He looks like he's having his best Zoom ever. Yeah, maybe you got a raise, actually, uh, or something really good has just happened to him. So let me tell you what I would do to raise the energies. Number one, minimize PowerPoint. I have sort of waxed lyrical about that already, but it's really important for energy. If you want a low energy meeting, just have PowerPoint the entire time, full screen, and people can only see that. So that's the first one. Number two, you should try some audience interaction techniques. And one of the ones I haven't talked about so far is called reactions. It's a reasonably new thing in Zoom. They've only had it for about six weeks. And so if you have a look at the bottom on the right hand side, you'll see that there's a reaction button and you can do an applause or you can do a thumbs up. So my recommendation to you if you're going to use that is you introduce people to it at the beginning and say, Today in this presentation, I'm going to be using the reactions and I'm going to need your feedback. So test them out right now. Give me a thumbs up and you'll see that the thumbs up goes on and then it stays on for a bit and disappears by itself. So if you're wondering, oh, it's staying there for a little longer and you've clicked it again, you've actually made it stay up longer. So you just click it once and then it stays there. Or you can do, okay, now give me a round of applause. It's the button on the left. And so where that appears is you can probably see it's on the top left of your video. It's on the top left of everybody's video. So the reactions are a really fun, quick way of improving the interaction and the energy. I have seen a lot of meetings where they'll pass between different people. And in a normal event, we applaud when somebody new comes on and applauding while everyone's mute just doesn't have the same effect. So some of the really cool meetings I've attended is they use the sign language form of applause, which I didn't know existed. But it looks like this. Yeah, like spirit fingers, holy nose. Yeah, so you, you might say you might pass to, uh, you know, in your case, Holly, you might be interviewing your authors and you say, all right, now next we're going to hear from our author, Vicky. She has written three books on um, managing behavioral problems in children. Let's give her a big round of applause. And then, okay, everyone, go with me on this. Come on, give me a round of applause. Give me a round of applause for Vicky. And you can see everything changes on screen. There's a lot of energy and people are moving. And so they feel a bit lighter and brighter and pay attention. So um, I would try that to raise the energy as well, especially where you've got multiple presenters. I've been on a call with a, a business coach that often uses things um, with his hands. So he's one of those um, performance types, you know, he, he rides bikes every day for 100 kilometers and he likes to run marathons and Ironman. So he is a really energetic kind of a guy, but he'll do things like this. Okay, everyone, give me a fist pump. Come on, give me a fist pump. And he'll make people do fist pumps on the screen um, and uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up are really useful if you're uh, testing a sound issue. So you might say at the beginning, okay, everyone, give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides. And that way you don't have to have people unmuting you to, to get that feedback. 
So um, yeah, having that audience interaction and setting those ground rules early will help you with the energy ongoing. I think you should encourage questions or at least have a question and answer kind of a segment and tell people how they can ask questions. So in my case, I told you, you could unmute yourself if you're brave or you just put the questions in the chat. And that's quite helpful that people know that at any point they can jump in and ask a question. If you do that, you may want to get your co-host to be recording those questions for you somewhere. So if I wasn't so great with maybe interruption style, I could say to Agatha, Agatha, every time you see a question in the chat, can you please record it somewhere? And at the end of a section, I'll come to you and, and say, okay, Agatha, what questions do we have? And she'll just read them out in order and I'll answer them in order. So that's another way that you can manage that interaction energy there. You may have seen uh, that uh, you can do a poll. So down the button, down the bottom, there's a button that says polls. Now, I did actually set up a poll today to show you, but let me tell you an interesting thing about polls, is if you share your account with somebody else, your polls become inactive if they log in. So in this case, we've had somebody else log into the account, and so I can't share the poll with you. What it tells me is, uh, you are logged in from another device, your polling session is inactive. And so that's a bit of a gotcha if you, lots of companies share their Zoom accounts, because you have to pay the same amount again for a second account. So just be aware of that. If you're going to run a poll, then, um, then yeah, you, you must be the only person logged into your Zoom account at the time. Uh, something you can do uh, also is use polls for a sort of formal voting process. So you can use it for feedback, or you, uh, in the case of where I was managing an AGM, we used it to elect their officers for next year. So people could choose between who the officers were and you can elect to share the results on screen so everyone can see them or you can just keep the, the results private and announce them. So polls are a great way if you have some kind of formal survey kinds of questions and you need to get through them. You could unmute people if you're really brave. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So I'm gonna unmute you all now. So all participants are now unmuted. Some of you have controlled your mute, so not everyone's unmuted. And so already we, I just heard a little jitter. So here, here have, there's some background noise. So you might say, okay, everyone, I'm gonna open this up to discussions now. I'm gonna unmute everyone. And you'll catch some people who aren't paying attention or some people getting a coffee or anything like that. So, okay, I'm gonna mute you all now. Unless you have a question. Does anyone have a question? No, good, all right. There we go. Now, when I mute you all, I do actually get the option. It's a little tick box that says, can I allow participants to unmute themselves? And depending on the style of presentation you're doing, the answer might be yes sometimes and the answer might be no at other times. So you can control that as well. Restricting people's ability to unmute themselves can make them really angry because they might not know that they can't do that and they'll sit there clicking the mute button trying to unmute themselves and they get really frustrated. So I've seen that in the meeting before as well, where they start saying really mean evil things in the chat because they can't unmute themselves. So just be aware of that from the managing perspective. I would encourage you when you're presenting to take a look at your video fairly regularly, because if you're looking at yourself on video, I know it's a bit weird, it's like looking in the mirror, but you can see what your own energy is like. And um, if you've ever been a dancer before, you'll know that the studio is covered in mirrors so that you can constantly improve your dancing performance. And I do think looking at your own video will also improve your presentation performance. And saying that, you know, I'm looking at my video right now and you'll see that I'm using my hands a lot more. <laughs> so, um, so it does definitely work. And then finally, consider when you see questions in chat or if you do a webinar, there's the Q&A feature. What people tend to do as a presenter is this. Oh, yep, I've got a question here for Holly. Uh, can you, uh, 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 yep, yeah, Holly, you can do that, yeah. And so everybody else on, on the meeting's just gone, what did Holly ask? And they have to go and read the chat. This is actually a technique that people do live as well, is they hear the question, but only one half of the room hears it and the others don't. And the person on stage is answering a question that half the room doesn't know what it is. So my recommendation is 
what you'll probably do is read the question. You should reinterpret it and then say it to everyone. So Holly's asking about how to position people's videos on screen. Um, I don't really understand the question, so I might get Holly to unmute herself or you just go ahead and answer it. But it's important that you repeat it anyway, because mostly you'll notice that there's an awkward reading of the question and you don't really understand. So I want to quickly share my video because our time is almost up. So techniques for raising the energy. These are the bits that we just went through and I have a couple of examples. So rather than rehash these with you, I just want to show you a couple of examples. So this is a webinar I attended and um, can you see that I can see their slides down the left hand side and their video is this tiny little video. And this guy is a really engaging presenter, but those slides are a bit naff. So um, I don't think these are particularly good slides to be presented with for a whole hour. So I, uh, this is just to show you that it's much nicer to see people. Another meeting that I attended is um, I've split my screen so that you see those little lines there next to the video. I can slide them over and make the presentation a lot smaller and see more of the videos. And I do this all the time when I'm on meetings where I just see the PowerPoint because it's really dull. And then finally, this is what it looks like when you're presenting directly to somebody. I think it's a lot nicer than, um, than seeing the slides front and centre. So that's our time today. We've reached two o'clock. Would anybody like to be brave and unmute themselves and jump on in with a question? Ooh, there's tumbleweed uh, and cricket. Nikki, is, is this recording going to be made available to us? It is, yes. Agatha always makes them available. So if you check your email from Business Station, she'll email it out to you once it's ready to go live. And I think she pops them up on YouTube. I'm too scared to watch my own recordings, by the way, but I really should for feedback. <laughs> That's correct. Thank, thank you, Nikki. I did want to say uh, this is going to be published on our YouTube channel. So you'll be the star of Business Station YouTube channel. Um, I will be sending the recording directly to you guys as well. But if you now go to YouTube, chat, YouTube and actually find Business Station Inc. and subscribe, once this is available, you actually get a notification. That's probably even better. Then you can rewatch yourself and this, uh, this meeting. So did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did, Nikki. Um, some of the things that you've mentioned, I haven't been able to see on my screen. Presumably yep. those are my settings that I have to go and check. Like poll, I haven't got poll on here. So okay. it must be in my settings. Not only that, is the controls are a little bit different as a host than what they are as an attendee. And that was why I recommended to you that you really should practice with somebody so that you can see how they're a little bit different as a host and they don't trip you up on the day. So I can see polls on my end, but you won't be able to see it on your end because it's become inactive once, um, once we started. So okay. yeah, that's why. But okay. when you do a poll, it actually jumps up front and centre and it takes over everything. So it's quite obvious when, right. when the polls happen. Yeah, I yeah. think um, I need to go and look at my settings. Yeah. Now, okay. One of the settings you really should have a close look at is turning on that co-host facility. And you yeah. do that through the Zoom website. In fact, it's a very long list of settings in the Zoom yeah. website. If you go through them with a fine tooth comb, see if there's any there that you might want to turn on. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry, sorry, Nikki, I did, I did actually uh, launch your poll. I think that's the poll that you actually created. I launched it and I got four people out of 12 that has actually voted. So if you guys did find out that, um, you know, request for a poll, um, please do. There you go, six people. The 50%. Yeah, there we go, cool. So as a host, I don't get to participate in the polls either. So that's another really interesting thing to test is that, yeah, it's... um. Polls in particular can really stump you up, but honestly, there's no other better way to manage online voting right now. There are a few online voting platforms, but polls are the easiest when you've got people inside Zoom already. Trevor, did you have a comment about that? Uh, I was just wondering, is, is poll something on your business uh, account? I've never seen it before. I've got the pro version, and until I saw you bring up your screen earlier that showed it, I'd never ever seen it as something in the setting. Yeah, I believe you've got to turn it on first. 
I've got the Mic Pro version, so um, I, I would say that that's one I've turned on, yeah, many, many, many moons ago. Yeah. Vicky, you want to jump on in? So unmute yourself, bottom left. Oh, no, she had to go. <laughs> um, there's one more thing. I think the uh, breakout room that we didn't cover today, but that could also be interesting that you have to turn on first. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I might just come back to that, Agatha. So you've got a question first? Yes. Um, one other thing, uh, more of a comment than anything else. What I've noticed is that in the list of participants, I'm always at the top with the presenter underneath me. And I, I don't know what special favors I've done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, open, if you open up your participant window now, yeah, yeah, you'll always be up the top. So me as the host, I always see myself at the very top and anybody else speaking comes in underneath that. So you see the active yeah. microphones, I've got Holly and Sue yeah. sit underneath that and that's because they're the active microphones that are unmuted right now. All right, <laughs> but I've been at the shop all the time. Yeah, because that's how you see oh, yourself yeah. always, yeah. All right, that's fine. Not a problem, just wondered. Awesome. Yeah, the now, thing I, I see. About breakout rooms, and I just want to explain those to you. But what a breakout room is, you have to turn them on in your meeting settings first, and it creates a little room that you can put people into and pull people out of. And they're very, very useful, how I've seen them used anyway, is if a couple of people in the meeting need to discuss something privately and then come back to the main room, I've also seen them used for training. So you have a plenary session in the Zoom session like we're having now, and some people can go off to their own little workshop and they can have a separate co-host sitting in there. So breakout rooms are really like a small room at an event, but they work and operate exactly the same way as what the main Zoom room does as well. So I would encourage you to experiment with that if you're going to do a large scale meeting. So a small meeting like this, we wouldn't really use them. But if you've got maybe 30, 50 people, something like that, that's when you probably will see the need to have a breakout room. I'm just about to organize an employment expo for an organization and they're going to use the breakout rooms to run group interviews. So they're gonna have a presenter speak about their company and then move to a breakout room with people in attendance who would like to apply for a job. And so they're gonna talk about that job in a group interview setting inside the breakout room. So they're, they're really quirky for a big scale meeting. Trevor, you, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, just on the uh, participants, I always like to grab it and expand it. You can make it a lot bigger than just the little box that Zoom throws to you and you can get to see everybody in it. Everybody up to a point. On big meetings, they still have to scroll down. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good tip actually, especially if you're the host. Um, what is frustrating though, is you often want to scroll through the waiting room and you can't expand the, rating, the waiting room panel at the top. So yeah, one of the interesting little quirks of, of Zoom, definitely. Now, Nermal's asked a question about breaking, breakout rooms. Who is the host of the breakout room? In the case of, um, of a breakout room, you've got multiple co-hosts. Let's talk about that situation. So today's meeting, I'm the host. So that means I started the meeting and I have the most amount of control. Secondly, I've assigned Agatha as a co-host and she almost has the same amount of control as me. In fact, I think the only thing she can't do is end the meeting. So she can do everything else that I can. With a breakout room, the person who started the meeting, the host, is still the host. And so what you should do is assign a co-host to the meeting room so that they can mute and unmute people as necessary. So you don't get a separate host for a breakout room, but best practice is to actually have a co-host in each of them. You can send out a global message as the host. So how that's useful is, okay guys, breakout rooms are finishing in five minutes. We're all going to return to the main room. And it's like a teleportation system. Everybody just auto magically comes back to the main room. It's quite good. Yeah. All right, do we have any further questions? Well, you've been a very awesome audience today, very attentive and asked lots of things. We've got a little bit of overtime, so thank you so much for staying with me. And um, I will perhaps see you on another Zoom soon. Or if you would like any one-on-one -on -one help, contact Agatha. There's lots of ASPAS consultants that can help you with upskilling you in the digital realm. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick.